job for him. Uh, his economic spokesman is supposed to be a man of some talent. Uh, the party chairman, Steve Crowver, is actually very good on the media. Um, I had several people ask me after seeing him on television, who is that guy? He's not bonkers. Um, so he's clearly got something that a lot of UKIP um, people have not got. I've met him and he's, a, you know, actually comes over as a very nice guy. So if they were to use him more, he's a candidate in North Devon. Um, that might be a good idea uh, as well. But talking of candidates and talking of MEPs, um, of course, there is also a downside risk from these people in that they will do and say things that expose the party to uh, ridicule or even bring it into disrepute. Having said that, however, that's what a lot of people said coming into this election, and uh, UKIP did not seem to suffer. Um, the more candidates or councillors were exposed as being um, racist or you know just plain um, idiots, uh, it didn't really... Um, seem to, to matter a great deal to uh, UKIP and uh, the view that was held of it by those people who wanted to vote for it anyway. The other uh, vulnerability UKIP have got is clearly policy. Um, they haven't got any. Now in some ways this is good um, because <laughs> you can't be attacked but they must presumably, um, unless they defy all um, laws that apply to, to most political parties, there must come a point at which they do have to get some uh, policies and defend them. Uh, Farage has completely disowned the 2010 manifesto, um, but he has acknowledged himself that you know UKIP does need to build uh, and construct a policy platform for next time around. That could be problematic because once the electorate is confronted with some of UKIP's policies, which are uh, towards the neoliberal end of things, and uh, in particular are much more sceptical about the value of things like the health service, the minimum wage, etc., that, that actually have a lot of support uh, among people who would otherwise vote for UKIP, um, that might cause them um, to, to come unstuck. Um, the other thing that UKIP has to do is to decide on its attitude to some kind of deal with the Conservatives. Now, this won't be a national pact, if you like, but there may be a series of local agreements... Uh, and we've already heard noises from UKIP, um, both in the last election and since then, um, about the idea that they will stand down or not stand candidates in um, constituencies of which the Conservative MP uh, declares himself publicly to want to leave the European Union. Now, actually, the number of Conservative MPs who are publicly signed up to this better off out um, stance is very, very small. You can literally count them on the hands, on, on the fingers of, of two hands. It's about ten. Um, but it could be that more Conservatives, particularly in marginal seats, may declare themselves as such if they feel that it will help them um, uh, uh, by preventing UKIP from standing. Um, Farage, though, is still, um, I think. Um, speaking out of both sides of his mouth on, on that particular issue. But we'll see if, if any kind of commitment hardens up. So that's UKIP, but I will return to you because obviously they're the big story. Um, in terms of the big losers of the um, past few days, uh, then they are clearly um, the Liberal Democrats. Now, why have they lost so much support? I think it's just the ongoing logical consequence of their decision to enter what was... Uh, counterintuitive coalition with the Conservative Party in 2010. Um, I think it would have been perfectly feasible for the Liberal Democrats to enter that coalition had they not campaigned for the um, uh, years prior to that general election as a party somewhat to the left of New Labour. Um, the problem for them was that they did that and therefore the, the um, coalition with the Conservatives, while it made perfect sense for people like Nick Clegg and David Laws and Orange Book liberals, market-friendly liberals, if you like, it didn't really make sense to a lot of people uh, who voted Liberal Democrat in the electorate and for a lot of people who um, were actually Lib Dem uh, activists, although many of them have been prepared to give Clegg the benefit of the doubt until now, possibly. Um, the other problem, of course, is not only the joining of that coalition, but actually how the Liberal Democrats have behaved in that coalition um, they have been seen by their um, most vociferous supporters on the centre-left 
um, by a lot of the electorate as a bit of a pushover for the Conservatives. In other words, there aren't that many things that you can point to, particularly when it comes to you know, the economic programme of the government, where the Conservative Party has not been able to get its way. Um, and I think that has uh, gradually um, uh, told on Liberal Democrat um, support. Now, Nick Clegg, as you've probably heard, has um, come under uh, quite a bit of pressure over the last um, day or two. Um, I don't know about you, but I, I uh, am on Twitter, uh, and I, I tweeted yesterday, breaking news, Deputy Prime Minister <coughs> resigns in Ireland. OK, but uh, that got quite a lot of retweets. Uh, presumably some people just read the first few lines and believed that it was, in fact, possible or had come to pass. Actually, um, he probably will survive. Uh, that seems to be the kind of common wisdom. Um, why is that the case? Well, a number of reasons. I, mean, I think um, there is, uh, although there shouldn't be, a kind of talismanic, totemic difference between getting one seat uh, in an election, which is what the Liberal Democrats did, and getting no seats whatsoever. Uh, it, it's absolutely ridiculous, but I do think that that, that does make a psychological difference. Uh, more importantly, however, is the fact that I think the, the strategy for the Liberal Democrats, which is basically keep calm, carry on, we will eventually get our reward for acting responsibly uh, in 2010, bringing stability to the country, bringing eventually uh, economic growth to the country. I, I think that strategy is, is set in stone and I, I think that most Liberal Democrats, in my view naively, still believe that in the end it could um, pay off. Other reasons why he might survive, well who wants to take over um, that party before what looks like it could be uh, a, a quite bad defeat. Uh, and anyway, you run the risk of, of looking as though you behave treacherously. Much better if you're interested in leading the party, and there are a fair few people interested in leaving, leading the party, believe it or not, still. Um, much better to wait till after the election, I think, um, to, make, to make your move. Also, one has to ask, what would be the point of replacing Nick Clegg if the party still intends to stay in coalition with the Conservatives? <coughs> Uh, it seems to me, um, you know, illogical really to, to replace the man who is the symbol of your intention to stay the course, and then say you're going to stay the course. So I, I think I think he's he's logically anyway probably um, safe. What the Liberal Democrats are destined to do then is sort of grind out the next year, basically, trying to differentiate from the Conservative Party as much as possible when they can, and reminding public the public of, of the achievements that they consider uh, are theirs, um, of which there are, one could argue, um, precious few, and certainly precious few that the public identify with them rather than with the Conservatives more generally. For example, um, the reductions in, in um, taxation for people on, on lower incomes. Um, I think their problem, however, is going to be and it's a problem they've had all the time, they don't control any big portfolios. They made the decision that it would be wise not to get, get any of the big jobs in government to have instead the Deputy Prime Ministerial job and uh, uh, Chief Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, and I think that has been a disaster. But you, know, you, you live and learn, and perhaps if they go into coalition another time, they, they won't make that mistake again. Whether they will face a wipeout at the general election, I think, is, a, is, a, is doubtful. Um, Liberal Democrats uh, tend to do better when they are incumbents, they tend to dig in quite well, and it's perfectly possible that even on just around sort of 10, you know, uh, percent of the vote, they might still retain sort of 25, 30 seats. I wouldn't absolutely bet on that, but I think they're fairly confident that it won't be a complete kind of meltdown um, situation for them in the general election like it almost was in, in the European election. So moving on to Labour then. Well, Labour, I think, are very disheartened. If you talk to people in the Labour camp at the moment, they're very disappointed with the um, elections. But in some ways, the, the elections, both the local elections and the um, European elections, didn't really um, tell Labour uh, anything it didn't know, or at least fear, uh, already, really. Um, uh, and what was that? Well, uh, UKIP appeals to some uh, of the so-called left-behind voters, white working-class people, uh, normally men without much education um, who feel the country's been going in the wrong direction since you know maybe the 1950s 
even uh, and would in some ways you know like the world to, to stop so they can get off um, everybody knew that but I think the extent to which it was actually going to eat into Labour's vote was perhaps underestimated so maybe there's a bit more concern about that uh, now than, than there was before Labour clearly knows from the polling that's been done around the election that it's not trusted yet on the economy um, uh, it also uh, knows that its leader is not only um, not inspiring um, to voters but is actually off-putting uh, to large swathes um, of the electorate. It knows it still has um, difficulty in winning seats uh, in the um, south of England which is problematic because of course there are a lot of seats there but it knows that it has London as this oasis if you like in the desert. Um, and it's very interesting if you compare um, the uh, situation in uh, Britain with the situation in Ireland, our populist party, UKIP, um, comes nowhere in, in, in the big cities. Okay? Where it does best is in you know, the small towns or the smaller cities out in the sticks, which is a complete kind of reversal in some ways, um, you, you can argue, as Sinn Féin has this ability to pick up seats in, in Dublin. Um, but but um, you know uh, the populist equivalent we have, although it will be on the right rather than the left, doesn't manage to do that in in, in Britain. Um, London seems to be a kind of UKIP free zone uh, at the moment. So does all this mean that Ed Miliband is in trouble? Probably not. He's probably safe, um, partly because it's institutionally extremely difficult to unseat a Labour leader, partly because it's culturally very difficult for the Labour Party to do that. It has a history of not getting rid of leaders, uh, as we know, um, from uh, 2007 to 2010, where most people knew that Gordon Brown was leading the party to a complete disaster uh, and yet uh, were unwilling, um, sadly for David Miliband, to um, plunge the knife into his back uh, and do something about it. If parties were rational actors, which they're not, the Labour Party um, may well um, try and dump him if they could find someone who was willing to take on the job uh, or, or someone who was um, capable of taking on the job. And there, there may well be someone like Yvette Cooper, current Shadow Home Secretary. Um, I, I think some people would agree would, would make a good job of it. Um, however, you know whether she's willing to do it is another matter. So I, I think they'll they'll stick with Ed Miliband, and Ed Miliband can argue. I think reasonably justifiably that he, he has made some good calls in some important uh, issues over the last uh, few years. But uh, the other reason is because Labour still, because of the quirks of the electoral system, and because it is actually running quite good organisation on the ground, still has a serious chance of finishing up as the largest party.